Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Dr. Silvio torres Ayant, who is the director of the Dominican Studies Institute, a research unit of the City University of New York, and the institute is located at uh, the City College of New York. Um, Dr. Sayant was born in the Dominican Republic. He came here at age 17, uh, couldn't speak any English at all, uh, worked his way through the high schools and got his bachelor's degree at City College and his master's degree at, and his PhD at NYU and is an associate professor at the City University as well as the director of the Dominican Studies Institute. Um, tell us about the Dominican community because I believe that most people in the city don't know very much about Dominicans. That is correct and that is in fact what makes uh, the existence of the Dominican Studies Institute so important. Uh, before we came into being in the uh, early 90s, uh, our, our first uh, the institute was. You, you were the founder of the I, institute I, I in 1992, the, right? Co correct, the founding director first as a as a project uh, uh, that that, w that th then became ratified in 1994 uh, when it was uh, voted in as the uh, as an integral component of the City University of New York under the research organized research uh, division. Uh, before we came into being. Uh, it was very hard to find information about Dominicans anywhere, uh, including in the uh, references that dealt with uh, Latinos in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, since then seen a, seen a significant transformation of that reality. Um, today, the Dominican uh, community, uh, the majority of whose members uh, is in, this, in the city of New York, um, it's uh, it presents uh, what you might call kind of contradictory uh, signs. On the one hand, it appears to be a, a, a very uh, dynamic community, very entrepreneurial, uh, hardworking, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, we have the uh, negative indicators of, of social uh, problems, such as high dropout rates, uh, as very high unemployment uh, among our communities. So you have those uh, well, two about, realities. About how many Dominicans would you say are in New York City uh, today? We say uh, so a safe estimate about 700,000. Uh, uh, and that makes it the second largest uh, Hispanic correct. community that in New correct. York City, yes. right? Yes. On the other it's also the fastest growing uh, yes. immigrant community. Well, let's, let's say then uh, 10 years from now about how many Dominicans you figure there will be in New York City. Um, it's uh, very easy to, to, to predict that right. it will surpass the million. Really? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Now, you are also a very recent group that in arriving great. in New York City. We in the Puerto Rican community uh, were really the first uh, large migration of uh, Hispanics to New York City, and the Dominicans are the second group, right? That is correct. And when did uh, the Dominicans begin to come in significant numbers to New York City? In the early 60s, uh, after the uh, a couple of historical uh, incidents coincide, on the one hand, you have the death of uh, Trujillo, the famous uh, tyrant who had uh, ruled the country with an iron fist for 30 years. And one of the uh, strategies uh, for, s for sustaining control was uh, to make it very hard uh, for people to leave the country. Uh, so immigration was, uh, uh, emigration uh, from the country was uh, very difficult. Uh, so that barrier was eliminated with his passing. Uh, then came uh, the Immigration uh, Act of 1965, the Family Reunification Act, which made it possible for pe people to petition for their, for their relatives. And, and that, uh, that gave a tremendous boost to the uh, mobility of Dominicans from the Dominican Republic to New York. And then in addition to that, you have um, the, 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 social, uh, the social turmoil that is, uh, that, that, that is produced in the Dominican Republic itself, in Dominican society itself, as a result of the uh, revolution of 1965. Uh, and, and that's when, that's when uh, Lyndon Johnson sent in the Marines, sent right? Sent the Marines, and, uh, and, and that is when a president uh, under United States uh, supervision and support 
uh, a, a president who represented the, uh, the interests of a former dictatorship was instituted, Joaquin Balaguer. Mm -hmm. And that, in a sense, I, I think uh, was a very powerful uh, push factor because what it did uh, uh, for people was it said that it was very difficult for there yeah, to but, be any change in this Balaguer society. Balaguer had the support of the United that States. That is correct. Right? That yeah. is correct. And that's one of the reasons why migration was made easier. It was made much easier. Uh, the, there is evidence, a uh, colleague of mine, uh, Professor Ramon Hernandez, uh, who wrote a book which is uh, coming out uh, soon from Columbia University Press. She documents there uh, quite firmly uh, that there was a very clear intent on the part of the Dominican government uh, with the collaboration w with, uh, of the uh, United States, uh, especially the State Department, to get Dominicans out. It was, uh, that strategy was thought to be a way to export, uh, to export dissent. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we in the United States do not have a pretty record when it comes to uh, interfering in the uh, countries of Latin America. That is correct. We, we, we for example, uh, invading the Dominican Republic in 1965 at the height of the popularity of Lyndon Johnson is not something that we have to be proud of, and then installing a president uh, who had the support of the United States. And I, I know that uh, that led to the migration of... Uh, that is correct, of, and it led of, to the yeah. economic transformation. Because unfortunately, whenever we uh, mess up things in any country, <laughs> the problems end up in New York City. It's one of the... Uh, of the uh, uh, part of the heritage that we have in this Well, city. it's quite clear that the United States at the time uh, thought that uh, giving, giving visas to people was one way of helping uh, the Balaguer regime to, to be stable at home. That's right. So in other words, I, I was a member of Congress, and, and, I, and I know that it was permitted because my friend, the mayor of Mayagüez, Benjamin Cole, um, and I, I would stay at his house when I went to Puerto Rico, and he would say, watch a night, you'll see the Dominicans coming over by boat. And I would say, but that's not permitted. He says, well, there's a quiet agreement between uh, the, uh, the Dominican president and the uh, State Department that we should not interfere, so therefore I don't interfere. But the reality is that with all of that, Dominicans have a harder time than we in the Puerto Rican community do when they arrive in New York City because we are American citizens by correct. birth. And you are not. And uh, many don't have all the necessary uh, legal documents. So it's harder for the Dominican uh, to uh, progress in the city because of the, uh, of the uh, failure to have citizenship. Uh, how old were you when you came here? And when did you come here? I, I came here in 1973, uh, April 3rd, 1973. Um, I was 17. And how did you happen to come here? Uh, my mother um, was one of those people who, who were pushed uh, by the uh, economic transformations that the uh, Balaguer regime implemented. Uh, she uh, went to, to, uh, to look for a visa, went to the American uh, embassy, and, uh, and did, all, did all the paperwork. It usually took about a year and a half to two years uh, to, 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 to be ready to leave uh, from the moment of starting uh, the affair. Um, my mother, uh, with all of her children, uh, came to the uh, United States. Uh, to seek the American dream. How many children were there? There were seven children altogether. Really? Uh, well, know. actually, one, uh, the, 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 the oldest of her children, mm -hmm. uh, our el eldest sister, whose name is Marina, for, uh, came first uh, through a marriage. Uh, she had married somebody who was already a resident uh, of, the, of the United States, who was a legal resident. That made it, made it possible for her to come. And then she assisted uh, our mother. Uh, and, and could you speak English at all when you came Not here? at all. Uh, so how long did it take you to learn the language? First of all, where did you come to live? And I when you went to school um, without being able to speak English, did you have bilingual education or uh, what kind of education I did, did you I had. I had, uh, well, when I first came to uh, New York in April 1973, um, I came uh, first, uh, the first thing that, that that, that was found for me was a job. I was working, uh, uh, since I had already uh, had a working experience in the Dominican Republic, I, I went to, to school at night in the Dominican Republic and worked during the day mm -hmm. in a shoe uh, workshop factory, mm -hmm. small right. factory. 
uh, when I came here, I already had a, I already ha had a, a trade that I could sell to the, to the market. Mm -hmm. So I found a job in, the, in a shoe factory in the, in the Bronx. Um, then after that, uh, that I had a some, somewhat of a stable income, you know, I started thinking about uh, continuing my education. I mm -hmm. was a student when I left. I didn't finish my high school. When I was here, uh, working uh, during the day and, and, and feeling the need to continue my education, uh, I felt that uh, it was clear that I was too old uh, to, to pursue my education through regular high school. Um, so what I opted for was somebody told me about the GED as an option, mm -hmm. which at the time was available uh, in Spanish. Oh, right. And so I benefited a great deal from that. Uh, that enabled me to, uh, to have a, a, a diploma uh, with which I went to Brooklyn College. And, uh, and, and what decided you to uh, become a scholar? Well, I had always uh, been interested in, in the world of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew uh, from very early, early on that, that I was interested in ideas. Uh, and, I, and my father was a person who was also a man of ideas. He didn't do too well. Uh, uh, himself, uh, he was one of the victims of the Trujillo regime. He was ostracized, and by the time the, the Trujillo regime ended, he was already uh, done for, as it were, uh, and couldn't recover. Uh, but he did have a passion for learning and uh, you know, knowledge of literature. Uh, erudition was a thing that was, uh, uh, that was acknowledged and, and appreciated at home. So you might say that, 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 that I sort of took vibes from, from that uh, environment there. And so when I came here, um, I immediately pursued pursue, uh, my education. I'm very glad that the GED in Spanish was available. Um, I didn't go to a bilingual education program. I, went, I took ESL classes. Mm -hmm. I took two semesters of ESL, uh, but, but I was also taking other courses as soon as I became, after my second ESL course, I felt courageous enough to take uh, courses in the in the discipline areas such as history, uh, such as science. Uh, I took some Spanish literature courses also uh, to make the load a little bit uh, less heavy. Uh, well, I took Spanish courses because I wanted to be sure that I would be fluent in Spanish because uh, obviously in Puerto Rico, I had, uh, only studied uh, in Spanish till I was 12 when, when right. I came here. But I wanted to be sure that I would be uh, absolutely fluent. In your, in your case, that would yeah, be an issue yeah. because you were young enough right. at that time. But when I came, I was already in the Dominican Republic a secondary uh, school student, so the fear of losing it was not so uh, so uh, so much of a, of a motivation, but rather uh, making my load uh, less, you know, not to have to deal with so much English all at once. Okay, we'll be back after these announcements. <laughs> When you mentor a child, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be yourself, which, by the way, is pretty good. Do good. Mentor a child. Call 1-877-BE-A-MENTOR. We're back today with Dr. Silvio Torres Ayant, who is the director of the Dominican Studies Institute at the City University of New York. Now that uh, we've gone into your background, and I wanted to do that because uh, you are typical of the first wave of Dominicans that uh, came here. Um, we want to talk about uh, what does the Dominican Institute do and uh, why is it important that we have it at the City University or in the city in general? The first thing is it compiles, uh, it produces, creates, disseminates, and gathers data about a community that is important in the city numerically and about which the city knows very little. So in a sense, uh, knowing the service that the Dominican Studies Institute is providing is helping the city of New York know itself better, know, know its population better. There is no, there is no uh, stopping uh, the continued growth of the Dominican community uh, in New York City. Uh, for instance, between 1990 and 1996, uh, among, among all the foreign-born mothers who had children in the city of New York, 
uh, Dominicans were the uh, number one at the top. And uh, well, the Dominican community is uh, probably one of the youngest communities in New York City, right? That is correct. Uh, what, what is the median age? Would you say? Uh, the it's uh, the median age is around if I if my memory serves me well. I am uh, tempted to say. 18 and a half. Yeah, well, that's very low. And, yes. and what happens is, the same was true of the Puerto Rican community when we first came. What happens is because the new migrants are always the younger people who are looking for opportunity, they're also the ones who are going to get married and have children. That is And correct. therefore, the reason the community expands enormously is because the practically everybody is of the uh, childbearing age. That is, that is correct. And, and so and that is the growth is not only attributable to the continued flow of, of migration, but also to that biological reproduction. And these, are, and these kids are already New Yorkers. Um, and, 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 and so by having knowledge available about this community, the, the city can be in a better position to serve that community, which is to serve itself. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the things that we are interested in looking at is whether the, the knowledge that we have about how Latinos learn and what are the needs of Latino students uh, throughout the city, uh, the state, or the country, uh, whether all of that ho holds true uh, for the uh, Dominican uh, case okay. as well. Well, the, the, uh, the public schools in New York City, in my opinion, are a disaster for the Puerto Rican community. Uh, there was a report in the New York Times a couple of months ago that uh, had the results of eighth grade tests in the schools in the South Bronx. And in school after school, the percentage of students <coughs> performing at grade level was exactly zero. Now, you can't get lower than that. Mm -hmm. And those were schools in predominantly uh, Puerto Rican areas of the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that it probably isn't any better for the Dominican community, right? Certainly, certainly. Uh, and another thing that we should pay attention to is the fact that uh, too often the problem of our students uh, are explained in terms of, uh, well, well, these students have, uh, well, it's the problem of the, of the immigrant, you know, the yeah. immigrant adaptation right. and so on and so forth. Well, uh, statistics seem to uh, indicate that the, uh, these Latino students uh, who are born in the United States are doing, wor are doing worse mm -hmm. than their immigrant antecedents, if you will. Same is true with Puerto Ricans, and the reason for that is very simple, because the ones who are born here are more insecure than the ones who are born there. For example, I was born in, uh, in Caguas, Puerto Rico. I came here when I was 12. Uh, up to the time I was 12, I was part of the majority. That is, uh, we were all Puerto Ricans, and therefore it's hard to get used to the idea of being a minority when you've been a part of the majority. I'm sure you had the same feeling. That's, that's correct. Uh, yes. and, but for, and therefore, we, not having been discriminated against till I was 12, I was not about to accept the fact that I was not as good as anybody else. So that's why a lot of people say that I'm arrogant, which I'm sure they say about you too. But well, probably the ones who, who are born here don't have the feeling because they always feel they're part of a minority, what is called a minority, and certainly is not very clear to us, right? That's correct. And, and, and I think that uh, th the, the fact also that when we come, uh, we are not as insecure, uh, and we, uh, in a sense, that security helps us deal with the discrimination that we might encounter. Because mm -hmm. right. we are prepared to, we know, we know that it has nothing to do with us. Uh, we came from settings in which we were not abnormal, and therefore we know that we are okay. Uh, and, and that, I think, it again, goes back to, to, to my attempt to answer that larger question. Why is uh, this e effort, Dominican research, so important? Well, in a sense, is what, it, what we try to do, and what all ethnic studies initiatives try to do, is to produce knowledge that will make it evident uh, to, to everybody, and including uh, members of the community, that we have a history that is as good and as bad, as complex, as evil and as virtuous as anybody else. And, and so in a sense, you become normal. Yeah. Now, you produce many books. For example, this one is on the Dominican migration to the United States, 1970 to 1997. And uh, you also have uh, 
documents of dissidents, and uh, you also have uh, many uh, documents in Spanish, right? No, we have some in Spanish, uh, but, but we have insisted on producing mostly in English. Because, uh, you know, we, the idea is to educate American society about, uh, about Dominicans, and the best way to achieve that is to, is to make the material available, the knowledge available in English. Uh, that those two uh, books that you've mentioned are both groundbreaking contributions. The first one uh, by Sara Aponte is an annotated bibliography of everything that has been uh, published uh, dealing with Dominican migration over the last uh, two uh, decades and, and almost three decades. And the first two, and the other one, Documents of Dissidents, uh, uh, an anthology edited and translated by uh, Daisy Coco de Filippis, who is at York College. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a compilation of essays by Dominican women from the 19th century to the present, so that in this way we contribute to, uh, to making these things available, so that, for instance, in women's studies courses, uh, a, a faculty member, a, a colleague, might consider including uh, Dominican uh, uh, texts, uh, so that in a sense, it's completing the history, making sure that Dominicans, l like everybody else, uh, have been writing, thinking, and doing uh, from the beginning of time, just like, just like anybody else. Well, what can we do to uh, help the Dominicans to achieve uh, better in education and in higher education at the City University? Because I'd like to see many more Dominicans coming in to uh, study at the City University. Well, uh, we are putting together, uh, we at the Dominican Studies Institute are putting together a socioeconomic and demographic profile of Latino students uh, in the public schools. Uh, this is a, a, a conversation. Uh, not, not, not just Dominicans, not but all Latinos. But all Latinos. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part, actually, of a conversation uh, in which you were involved at the beginning, and, and, and Vice Chancellor Jay Hershenson uh, played a significant role. And we are now uh, just about the time when we can present the research proposal. The idea, what we uh, plan to do, is to try to answer all the questions regarding the, the needs that uh, Latino students have. Because uh, the needs of a, uh, of, a, uh, of, the, of a child who is the son or daughter of uh, Indians from the backlands of Guatemala are not the same as the needs of, a, of, a, of an urban guero uh, from, from the city of Mexico who might come from a middle class background. Uh, it is even uh, dangerous to assume that, lang that, that the, their language is the exactly, same right. because uh, it could very well be that, this, uh, that for this uh, Indian student, Spanish is not his or her first language. It could be the, the original Indian the, language. So, the, so what we need is a social, economic, cultural, uh, demographic profile to try to establish what, uh, what every community looks like in terms of what it has, its assets, and its needs. Okay. So we can best address those needs. Okay, now tell me this. We have first Puerto Ricans, secondly Dominicans. What groups are coming into, what Latin, Latino groups are coming into S New York City today? Uh, Colombians and Central Americans uh, are, are, have a significant presence. From, from Mexico primarily or from... Uh, Central, uh, uh, no, uh, mostly Mexico, uh, we know the history of, of Mexican uh, migration to the United States. That continues unabated. Uh, but, but the Mexican presence is growing tremendously. In New, uh, New York City. In New York City. As a matter yeah. of fact, you can see Mexicans in Washington Heights. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and unfortunately, they are doing uh, n even worse than Dominicans mm -hmm. in terms of the socioeconomic uh, scenario. Uh, you see uh, Mexicans working in a lot of uh, Dominican uh, supermarkets, right. uh, you know, as delivery people. So uh, th that is a community that needs to be looked at closely. Now, will this study look at all the Latinos? Th th this study will try to produce a picture of every Latino subgroup. And when do you think uh, you'll be able to begin and finish that study? We have it slated for uh, spring and summer of 2001. And, uh, and, uh, and the City University of New York will be receiving the proposal uh, for approval. Uh, and for you'll approval. Have, you, you expect it will be completed by then, by the, we, by we the summer? We, that, that is correct, yes. And, uh, it, and of course, it will be coming to you, it will be coming to... No, no, listen, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, eagerly awaiting it because the fact is that uh, we don't have enough information about the uh, different uh, 
Latino groups in the city of New York and the extent to which they continue to come and also the extent to which they go back to their countries because that's one of the things that happened with the uh, uh, first, second, and third generations of Puerto Ricans, that those who uh, got an education uh, or made some money, unfortunately, went back to Puerto Rico. So you mm -hmm. may expect that to happen. We have a little, a, a little bit of a return migration. Mm -hmm. It hasn't yet become um, uh, numerically significant, but it's, but it's happening. And we are also uh, interested in, I mean, in predicting what's going to become of this city. Okay. If one of its largest uh, components uh, in the population is not doing well, what does the, what is, what's going to happen to the city? Especially well. as the uh, white population is decreasing, uh, has decreased. Uh, at one point in 1970, I believe, the white population was 63%. Right. And then uh, 25 years later, it was uh, 35%. Right. Well, we can't, uh, can't wait to get the results, but unfortunately, we're out of time for now. So uh, come back when you're ready with any results of that uh, scholarly work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cuny.tv, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.